I want everyone listening to this to know that I am absolutely innocent. A knock on the door, a delivery of flowers, and a single gunshot wound to the head. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lita McClinton. Viewer discretion is advised. Lita LaVon McClinton, she was born on January 7th, 1952 in Atlanta, Georgia. Lita was the oldest of three children in the McClinton family, and she was born into wealth. Her parents, Joanne and Emery, were a very prominent couple there in Atlanta, Georgia. They were considered one of Atlanta's most prominent African-American families. Her parents were instrumental throughout politics and influencing certain people for certain roles in politics. Her mom was actually a state representative, and her dad was a very high-ranking official in the Department of Transportation. They lived in a, a very affluent neighborhood, and Lita and her siblings basically got everything they wanted. The three kids, uh, basically, they got every advantage they needed because of their parents' influence. She grew up with elegant and extravagant parties, attending high-profile social events, and she mingled with the best of the best. Lita would get solid grades throughout school, she attended college, and then she aspired to pursue a career in fashion. Lita was someone who was really kind of in love with the whole idea of the retail industry, and she really hoped to one day own her own store. But then everything kind of changed in 1975 when she met a very wealthy socialite named James Sullivan. James, being a white man who was about 10 years older than Lita, was also very, very well known. He had inherited his father's business, which was Crown Beverage Incorporated, but after some time, he ended up selling that business for about five or six million dollars. And that was back in 1983. So, so five or six million dollars back then was obviously, t in today's money, was a lot. On December 29th, 1976, Lita and James got married. Lita then became Lita Sullivan. They would then move to Palm Beach, Florida, and they bought this beautiful home there. There were issues, however, once they moved to that part of Florida, Again, this is the 80s, and the whole concept of uh, interracial marriage, you know, a white man married to a black woman, unfortunately didn't sit well with, with a lot of people back then. They also had those same issues in Atlanta, Georgia, because this is, you know, the, the deep south. And apparently, for James, this was a, a hindrance, that he wasn't able to advance further or become wealthier or he wasn't able to mingle with the people who he needed to mingle with, he blamed because Lita, you know, her being a black woman. Lita's parents also didn't really like James that much. He they just he just didn't rub them the right way. He was proven to be a very dishonest man. He had lied to Lita, his their her parents found out about previous marriages, about children he had. And so once Lita kind of found out about that stuff, she began to distrust him. Then you had this whole concept of the interracial marriage just not being accepted by the communities they lived in, either in Atlanta or in Florida. It caused a significant rift in their marriage. And then eventually it, it led to Lita filing for divorce. And then she would move back to Atlanta, Georgia and she had moved back into the home that the couple had owned out there. This big, beautiful, like, mansion-type building. The divorce was not uh, a good one. It was not amicable. It was, a, it was an ugly divorce. Lita had basically, when she filed for divorce, she was going to take roughly half of his, what he had, which would have been an estate worth about $5 million. I guess there was a postnuptial agreement that in the event of a divorce that she would be getting a $2,500 monthly alimony payment. 
However, she was going to fight for more. There was a divorce settlement set for January 16th, 1987. That day, Lita was supposed to go to court to testify. It was the very early morning hours of that January 16th, 1987 day in Atlanta, Georgia. Lita was just getting ready for the day. She was still in her bathrobe when a when the doorbell rang. When she approached the door, she opened it and there was a man standing there, a delivery man. He had a box of roses in his hand. He said that this is a delivery for you, for Lita. He then asked her, are you Lita Sullivan? And she said, yes. The man then threw the box of roses. He point lifted up a gun and shot through the box of roses and the bullet would go directly through Lita's head. She collapsed to the ground and she died instantly. The man then fled the scene, which was observed by witnesses. People did see this man. And a neighbor also heard the gunshot, and so they immediately called 911. I saw a man running from the coach's residences, and he almost ran into my car. I veered a little bit. Other witnesses would state that not only was there one man, the shooter, there were at least two other men who were involved, I guess, in the car that the shooter got into and took off. The neighbors, these witnesses, would later give descriptions of these men as best as they could. They came up with these composite drawings and dispersed those amongst the media. However, none of those men came even remotely close to matching James Sullivan's description. And James Sullivan, in fact, was still in Palm Beach, Florida at the time this murder took place. Something that was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. He was definitely not in Atlanta. When the description of these men went on to the news, a flower shop would alert police to say, I, those the, those images, I'm pretty sure I helped a, at least one very nervous man earlier that day to per, when he was, came into the shop to purchase flowers. Then other witnesses called police to say that they saw those three men checked into a motel or a hotel there in that area. So they found out the room that these men were in. They gave fake names. They weren't real names, so they weren't able to find them that way. But they did discover that from the hotel room, they did make phone calls. They were able to find out those phone calls went to none other than James Sullivan in Palm Beach, Florida. Police would contact James and say, hey, you know, your wife, your soon-to-be ex-wife was just murdered. She was shot in the head in the doorway of the home you two shared. And it was a very quick thing. Like, it just happened. It happened all within a matter of a minute, maybe two. But James said, I don't know anything about that. I obviously was here. I didn't do it. Millionaire James Sullivan spoke for himself. I want everyone listening to this to know that I am absolutely innocent. I had nothing to do with Lita's death. But the police were like, well, potentially the people who did this called you several times from a hotel room. I don't know anything about that. I don't know. Police then did a, they got a warrant for a wiretap of his phone. And so one thing that the police did not release to the public was the fact that Lita was shot and killed with a nine millimeter. There were actually at least two gunshots. One of them missed, the other one made obviously went directly through her head, but they never released that to the public. And so when they did this wiretap, um, James was speaking to another individual, stating something along the lines of, uh, he, he mentioned a nine millimeter being involved in this murder. He didn't, on this phone call, he didn't say that he, necessarily he was the one to do it or he was the one who hired people to do it but he stated to this on this call that there was a nine millimeter but nobody knew that at all so how did he however police have not been able at that point to track down the shooter or the three these three men and they also only had very weak circumstantial evidence against james sullivan so they really their hands were tied they couldn't do much they needed more. Well, James would eventually find a new woman. Uh, her name was Suki, and the two of them married. But once all of this information was coming out about this, about the murder, and then about two or three years after the murder, you know, Suki finds out about all of this, and not only that, but James is arrested for uh, expired tags on his car. He's now getting into legal trouble for that. He's actually sentenced to, I think, a year in prison for it. And then Suki, at that point in 1990, files for divorce from him. When she filed for divorce, 
she would contact the police to state that there was a point, there was a night when James Sullivan literally confessed to her that he was involved in the murder of his ex-wife, Lita. He told Sookie that he was the one to organize it. So then James was promptly arrested and he had charges of violating interstate commerce laws by arranging his wife's killing over the phone. Once this went to court, the judge dismissed it based on very, they had very little evidence, actual evidence. In 1992, James would sell his home and then move to another place in Florida. Lita's parents believed wholeheartedly that he did organize the murder of their daughter, and so they filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him. In February of 1994, they actually won that lawsuit and were awarded several million dollars. However, the Court of Appeals would later overturn that ruling, and apparently it was due to a statute of limitations issue. In 1998, this case had aired, I think, on Unsolved Mysteries. It aired on America's Most Wanted. It was a relatively high-profile case. And so a woman in Texas, when she sees one of these broadcasts, calls the her pol the police there in Texas that, hey, I recognize that James Sullivan guy. I am pretty sure I saw him pay money to my the boyfriend I had at the time. He paid my boyfriend $2,500. And her boyfriend's name at that time was Philip Harwood. So police talked to Philip Harwood and he said he knew James, that he had helped James move furniture into their home. Uh, this is back at, you know, West Palm Beach, Florida. After police brought him in for a more thorough questioning and kind of an interrogation, he confessed. He said he was the trigger man. He was the one who was hired by James to go to her home before this uh, divorce proceedings could take place and kill her. So in 1998, uh, Mr. Harwood was arrested and charged with the being involved in this murder. And then in May of 1998, there was a warrant issued for the arrest of James Sullivan. However, James Sullivan was gone. He fled the country. Police had gotten tips about, oh, I've, you know, we've seen him in Ireland, we've seen him still in Florida, we've seen him in all places around the world. But eventually, by 2002, based on some tips, they are able to track James down in Bangkok, Thailand. So the police there in Thailand find him, they arrest him. And then he is extradited back to the States, to Atlanta, Georgia. By 2004, he is officially charged with aggravated assault and murder, conspiracy to commit murder. Philip Harwood was going to go on trial for this murder, and he was looking at possibly the death sentence, if not life in prison without parole. So he works with the DA, and he says, listen, I'll cut a deal. I will testify against James Sullivan at trial for a more lenient sentence. And so he ends up pleading guilty. He pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and the guy who shot and killed Lita, who literally ended her life, was only sentenced to 20 years in prison. I, I never understand that because that's happened several times before where the actual killer, the actual shooter, will get a significantly less time than the person who organized it. Now I understand Obviously, that wouldn't have happened if the person didn't organize it, but this person still made the decision and agreed to do this and shot and killed a person. It just It's just like, I wouldn't, uh, ugh, I don't know, it's just frustrating. So James goes on trial uh, starting in 2006, I believe. And of course, he's saying, you know, I was in Florida when this happened. You don't have any proof that I was involved, but they did. I mean, they had the phone calls, uh, at least based on, phone call logs that the people at the hotel, one of them being the man who actually shot and killed Lita, had called James after the shooting occurred. There were conversations or phone calls that happened between James and and uh, Philip. They didn't have those phone calls recorded, but there were phone calls nonetheless to prove that they were in contact. They also had that one tapped phone call with him stating that a 9mm was used in the murder, despite not a single person knowing that, for sure. And then they also had the testimony of, of not only his second ex-wife, Sookie, about him confessing to organizing the murder, but they also had the testimony of the guy who actually killed Lita and saying he only did it because he was hired 
by James Sullivan. And so James Sullivan was eventually found guilty of organizing the murder of his wife and various other charges, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Philip Harwood was, he did some time, and he was actually released in 2018 and is now a free man. Despite shooting a woman in her head, an innocent woman, uh, he is free. And as of right now, uh, James Harwood is still in prison. I believe he's in a medical center, but he will never be released ever again. He'll never breathe free air. He'll never see the light of day as a free man. And all for what? Because he was going to lose half of his assets. He murdered someone because, well, money. I mean, money is the, is the root of all evil, right? As they say. And that's one of the, the number one motives for any kind of murder is, is money, if not love. Sometimes both. But it was obvious there was no love lost between he and Lita. This this is all about just him essentially controlling the situation. He wanted to be in control of all of it, and he wanted all of his money. Uh, he would have still had several million dollars, but he didn't want that. He wanted all of them, all of the millions of dollars that he had. And he also wasn't even, there was no sure way of knowing if she would have even been rewarded uh, half of his assets. It may have just come down to the $2,500 a month alimony payments, but... He didn't want to take that risk and lose a couple million dollars. And so he had her killed. But luckily he hired um, people to do this that were very easy to, to uh, crack. Luckily there were many witnesses who saw the description of this man and were able to get a pretty good composite drawing of him. Luckily there was that tapped phone call. Luckily there was the the log history of phone calls between the assailants and James. And it, it was just, I mean, it was obvious that he was responsible for this. Now, did they ever find those other two men that the people saw? I don't think so. I don't think anyone's ever given them up. But it doesn't sound like they had any direct involvement in this anyway. It was really just primarily Philip Harwood who actually committed the murder and then James Sullivan who hired Philip to do it. But thankfully, because they were messy, thankfully, because they were just bad at this, it may have taken about 12, 13 years to finally get the justice, but it did finally happen. And Lita Sullivan never got to pursue that dream of owning her own retail store and kind of just being her own woman and building her own individual success, because by all likelihood, she would have. But James Sullivan took all of that away from the world for money. But luckily... Lita Sullivan and her family were finally able to get the justice they all rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case. True crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, uh, please subscribe to the channel if you are new here. I am Mike. I tell true crime stories, obviously. Sometimes I tell spooky stories as well. Uh, so please subscribe, give the video a like so more people can see. And then also you can follow me over on, I have two different TikTok pages where I tell short form true crime stories and other stuff. And uh, you can find the links to those uh, in the link tree in the description of this video below. Also in that link tree, you'll find my merch store. We have like t-shirts and hoodies. We ship all over the world. So check it out if you want to. And then if there is a case you want me to cover, whether it be a true crime case or some kind of spooky story like a haunted building or alien story or what have you, um, you can send me an email. My email is listed in the description below. Just a really quick email with the basic information and I will add that name to my list or that story to my list. The list is well over 6,300 names long. I pick every time at random for the most part. So I can't promise you when I'll cover that story, but I will get to it eventually. But at any rate, that is it for this video, True Crime Maroonies. So we will see you for the next one. Okay, you got it, everybody. Have a great... I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, goodbye.